Welcome to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. <laughs> Dell challenges the status quo, questions everything, and empowers you to return to your core beliefs to make your life better. If you're ready to hear the truth and get your roadmap to the lifestyle you really want, the next hour will change your life. And now your host, self-made millionaire, national award-winning investor of the year, CEO and founder of Lifestyles Unlimited, Del Wamsley. Welcome to the Del Wamsley Radio Show, where the hype ends and the help begins. I'm your host, Del Wamsley, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. Today, my friends, uh, we're going to pick back up where we started up a couple days ago, uh, which is discussing the book, Think and Grow Rich. And as I uh, had explained on this, uh, about this book earlier, multiple times actually, we've talked about this book. There's so much in the book, it's not possible for you to consume all of it in one sitting in general. So I wrote it, read it four, five, six times. I'm not sure how many times. I've got so many different colors in it, I can't remember. Um, other people said they read, read it even more times than that, and each time they still got something different out of it. The, the amount of knowledge is, is massive. And what has to happen in the learning curve scenario is that you learn a little bit at a time. You go as far as you can go with your mind because your mind doesn't have enough depth and enough perception and enough surrounding information to absorb everything that you could possibly learn. So what do you do? You chip away at it. Some people chip away at it from the outside in. Some people chip away at it from the inside out. Something we'll discuss here uh, a little bit more today. But wanting you to understand that um, because someone had written me after our discussion about how many times you have to read this book to get everything out of it, they said, well, why don't you give us some insights about the book that may make our first time through clear? And I do want you to understand, whatever I've discussed the other day, uh, the last couple of sessions I've talked about this book or what I discussed today, it's not going to in any way, shape, eliminate the need to read the book. All I'm trying to do is what one listener asked me to do, which is dig a little deeper in each chapter and give us some ideas of what the cursory first time through uh, reader might get out of it, or maybe even one or two steps deeper, uh, just to save you some time in ingesting the information this book has to share with you. So we pick it back up here, and there's you know we went through really about four or five chapters uh, Monday. And when we did that, I tried to do them in order, but really order doesn't matter in this book. You could pick up any one chapter of this book and read it, and it would make all the sense in the world freestanding. Sometimes some of the chapters are more easily understood after you have uh, retained the information from a future chapter. So sometimes reading it backwards and forwards and forwards and backwards makes sense. Uh, and I find that to be true about just about everything that I do. Uh, I learn the best when I go forwards and back and backwards and forwards because there are different levels of the ability of my mind to absorb information. So I'm going to try to share some of this with you today. The one today we're going to start with is something called imagination, the workshop of the mind. Ideas are products and are given shape through imagination. Humans can create anything they can imagine. So think of that. Humans can create anything that they can imagine. So I'm going to use an example. Um, I've really been getting into firearms lately. And as you go through and you use something new, you know, and I've done this example with dancing. I've done this example uh, with trains. I've done this example, whatever hobby I pick up is that it's something new, completely new, that I've just decided to go into. And so when you go into it and you get deeply involved in something, and that's the way I generally find myself. I'm either not interested at all or I'm deeply interested. Um, What happens is you start with a cursory outside review, and then you start to try to learn, to understand, because you really can't do much until you totally understand what's going on. So let's take that as far as learning real estate and so on and so forth. I did a a show one time uh, about dancing 
and movement and how it relates to real estate, how you have to learn to move and then you have to learn to move correctly and then you have to learn to move correctly to the music and then you have to learn to move correctly to the music with other people. Uh, That's the book. That's Think and Grow Rich, man. That is everything. It's just exactly the way it is. So first of all, you have to be able to imagine it. Right. You have to imagine that it's possible for you to dance. I know when I was a kid, dancing meant was impossible for me. A little fat kid had no rhythm, couldn't keep a beat, couldn't sing, couldn't go to any music classes. I mean, you know, when they had music appreciation, it was almost like the most painful thing for me to do. Even though I loved to listen to music, it had nothing to do with it. I just couldn't produce it. Right. And so you have to start with basic concepts. So. What the book is saying is that there's really two different types of imagination, right? And one of them is called synthetic imagination. This is the faculty in, said, what is the state? This faculty includes the arrangement of old concepts and ideas or plans into new combinations. All right? So you've got your old ideas. I'm going to get into the stock market. And... You know, you, you've got all these ideas and plans to say, you know what, I think I'm going to do it differently this time. This time I'm going to sell sell short and sell long. I'm going to sell puts and shots and so forth. And I'm going to do it completely differently. You're still thinking about the same stuff. You're just rearranging the way you're looking at it as to what is important, what the priorities are, and so on and so forth. You're imagining a new way of using the same stuff, Right. You're imagining that. And when you use this type of an imagination, you can get a higher quality and volume of output with the same surrounding facts that you've been working with. But what I found is in these situations where you're saying, okay, like for us, you know, if you take up marketing, as an apartment complex, you know, the ideas used to be go put flyer, flyers on cars and parking lots, go to businesses and hand out flyers. Uh, you know, the basic ideas were so put an ad in the paper, you know, eventually put an ad in, you know, some type of online uh, advertisement uh, type deal. And those were all ideas that could be used. Your imagination said, I imagine that I should probably put more in line with online advertising than the old handheld advertising type methods. So you reimagined the way you were going to do things, right? But what I found was, is that when I really had some of my largest gains, um, completely largest gains, in marketing was when I realized that other people's ideas about this system of marketing, a system of marketing, were really outside of my own skill sets. And I remember one time we were interviewing for a marketing person, and uh, we interviewed like six, eight, ten people, and we narrowed it down to two people. And it was interesting because the two people had completely different ideas about what made marketing most effective. One of them had the idea that marketing was all about touching people. It was getting out. And it was in embedding yourself into their lives. How do you interrupt market them, right? Market interruption. Hey, TV ad, radio ad, uh, Facebook ad, boom, there it is right in front of you. You, you see it, and for the first time as a person being marketed to for first or multiple times, it's being thrown in your face, and it's interrupting your day to try to get you to think about somebody's product, right? So that's interruption marketing. And then I had another person that was completely different than that, and they said that marketing occurs most effectively when you market by multiple mini touches of people that have bought into the marketing. In other words, interrupting people with marketing is just going to irritate them. It doesn't really work. There's all kinds of um, 
data about, you know, when you just flash ads in front of people, you know, people nowadays, we just record on the TV right past all the advertisement and we go get something to eat or we just speed through it. And so interruption marketing has less and less and less effect. So what buy-in marketing is different where uh, somebody says, uh, hi, I got something free for you. Would you like it? And really, if they say yes, they're buying into letting you market them. We'll talk more about this when we get back to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Welcome back to the Del Wamsley Radio Show. Today, we're discussing some different levels of Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, and the one we're discussing when we went to break was something called imagination. And what I was trying to explain probably not doing a very good job of it, was the difference between synthetic imagination, which is the rearrangement of ideas you already have, but in a new and cleaner, more effective use, uh, or something else called creative imagination, where you're coming up with stuff that's completely different. And as I was talking about it was that when I was interviewing for marketing people, I was in the really synthetic imagination box over here looking, okay, I know I need better marketing, so let's uh, find somebody who can rearrange um, the checkerboard to make it a more effective checkerboard, Right. And, but when I started interviewing, I had a creative imagination moment. The creative imagination said, wait a minute, marketing isn't a single thing. Marketing is multiple layers of things. And then I went so far as to believe that marketing had multiple layers, and so did sales have multiple layers. And I realized that marketing and sales were not the same thing. They're completely different. And that so you now had multiple, multiple, multiple ideas, which gave you all kinds of new avenues to go out and be creative in. So instead of, as I had two people that were completely different marketing experts, my staff said, which one do you want to hire? I said, hire them both. And we took one person, put them in charge of all the interruption marketing, which was to go out there and get our ads going, our radio shows going, our outward marketing. And then we took one and turned around and said, let's do our uh, educational marketing program where it is permission marketing, I guess is the actual term for it, where you're sending them out some type of information that is beneficial to them. And if they go, I can use that, then I'm going to go ahead and read what you have. In other words, I'm going to give you a chance to sell me something. Thing, right? So they each completely changed my company and completely changed the quality and the quantity of the leads that were coming in the door. And all I could do was sit there and my mind was just expanding rapidly. And I was imagining all of a sudden, and there's this imagination, that word imagination. I was imagining, you know, doubling or tripling the volume of the business, which blew my mind. It just blew my mind. Same thing happened when I was doing single family housing and I had, you know, the synthetic imagination was here's a better way to do single family houses, a better way to buy single family houses. Here's a better way to finance single family houses. Here's some tricks on how to keep the maintenance down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then one day I ran into the concept of multifamily housing. And this was completely different than synthetic imagination. This was creative imagination saying, wow, there's a whole different world out here that's done completely different and way more productive than single family housing. And it was because I was able to create in my mind a whole new vision of what real estate investing could be that I ended up becoming a multi, multi millionaire. I mean, it just, I never could have become that rich. And, and I did make a million dollars with single family houses, but it's a million. That's it. And he said, well, laugh and be, give me the million. Yeah, that's a good start. We'll start there with you, right? But after that, you go like, uh, you got a million. What's your next goal? 
And this is where that creative imagination goes. It just kind of blows your mind. You go, like, okay, am I a 10 millionaire? Is that even a term? I'm a 10 millionaire? And if it took me to age 35 to become a millionaire, how long before I can become a two millionaire? Well, once I learned apartments, I learned I could make a million dollars in a single transaction. In other words, one apartment complex between captured equity, uh, forced depreciation, cash flow, tax benefits, et cetera, et cetera, the five ways we make real estate, make money using real estate, I was able to make a million dollars on a single deal. So what did I do? There now I've got creative imagination. I go out and buy, you know, a 10 unit apartment, then a 20 unit apartment, then a 30 unit apartment, then I bought a 40 unit apartment, then I bought a 64 unit apartment, then I bought a 68 unit apartment, then I bought an 88 unit apartment, then I bought a 106 unit apartment, then I bought a 140 unit apartment, then I bought a 256 unit apartment, then I bought a 270 unit apartment, then I bought a 320 unit apartment. But all that was really the same thing. And if you look at it, before I was buying house, I bought one house, and then I I bought three houses, and then I bought 10 houses together, and then I bought 30 houses together. Uh, So, And then I bought 45 townhouses together. That's right. So, again, it was linear. It was one house, two house, 10 house, 12 house, 20 house, 50 house, 100 house. And then it was linear, 10 unit, 20 unit, 30 unit, 40 unit, 50, or never did a 50, did a 64 unit, uh, 68 unit, 88 unit, you know. 106, 107, you know, it was 106. Ooh, can't remember all. 250, 256, 270, 320. And, And I'm just making the point that even though I was adding units to each one of those complexes, it was each transaction was getting larger. I was still doing the same thing. It was synthetic imagination. I was imagining more of what I already could imagine and not something completely different, right? So when you look at this thing, um, I had I had a niche. And then somewhere along the line, I had some creative imagination again. Something hit me that said, you know, you've gone from, you had 70s construction stuff, 60s construction stuff, 70s construction stuff. I remember talking to someone one time and saying, you know what, I'm getting out of this 70s stuff. This stuff is too old. I'm going to 80s. And I'm thinking, man, I'm really upgrading my life going to 80s. And and then I said, I'm going to get out of the 80s. I'm going to go to 90s. But about that time, the world changed, and there really wasn't any 90s stuff out there. And so I had to jump to the 2000s. And so I said, I'm going to get out of this old 80s stuff. I'm going to go 2010 and above, which is 30 years newer. Now, think about that. When I first started the business, 80s were Class A apartment complexes. In my mind, they were untouchable. But through a completely different form of imagination, I imagine this concept that stuff changes. Ages change. Your portfolio has to change. So where do all of these ideas come from? Right? Well, you have to stimulate them. You have to just sit back and think. You have to look at what's out there in front of you and go, okay, I can get all types, all types of synthetic imaginational ideas, and I can rearrange the pieces on the chessboard. Or I can go find a new game. And that's basically... That's basically what you have to do to become highly successful. You're out here listening to this radio show about something you have no idea how to do. You're opening your mind. You're letting ideas float around in it. And your creative imagination is going, God, I've heard this a thousand times, by the way. I didn't know before I came here that a normal person could own an apartment complex. I thought they're all owned by giant corporations. Wow, what a creative imagination to come up with the idea you actually can. We'll take a short break. Be right back with the Del Wamsley Radio Show.
Welcome back. Now here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Welcome back to the Del Wamsley Radio Show. We're taking a deeper dive into Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Just trying to get some ideas out there on the table that might help somebody. Maybe one thing jogs your memory. Or your, I'm sorry, jogs your imagination and you start thinking about the world in a different manner. And maybe that's the one that tips your scale. Um, there's a book out there called The Tipping Point that talks about how in life what happens is Things happen to us, happen to us, happen to us, happen to us. Things happen in life, happen in life, happen in life until they get to this point. It's called the tipping point when all of a sudden it's just enough information, it's just enough belief, just enough buy-in that things go over the top and things change in your life forever. And um, I've witnessed tipping points in my life dozens and dozens of times. But one of the things that I found to be true uh, is one of Napoleon Hill's chapters in this book is called uh, Organized Planning. Or basically, you've got to have a written plan is what it comes down to. And I would like to share the concept. And I'm not going to do this one justice because he goes, he has a completely different idea, a little bit deeper idea about organized planning. But the thing is, is that if you don't have a written plan, you won't get there, period. If you don't write things down, you won't get there, period. There is a concept out there in the universe that unless you can track it, you can't change it. You have to be able to track it. So... I can track my blood sugar. My blood sugar can go crazy, and it's almost like I can will my blood sugar back down. I know where it's at, what it's doing by watching it and taking it on a regular basis. I know I need more exercise today. I need less carbohydrates today. I can get where I need to go. I can get healthy, but I have to write it down. I can't just willy-nilly not track something. So to track something, you need a map. Now, I've always looked at a map as like uh, thinking about something like going from Houston to uh, Dallas and think, okay, you get in the car, and do you actually follow the map? Well, to some degree, yes, but many degrees, no. The map is only just a representation of the real world. It's not the real world. You can't live specifically on a map that's accurate. So, like... When I started looking into bodybuilding, um, when my daughter was looking into bodybuilding, she came, started getting good at it. I said, okay, I'm just going to, you know, I'm 63 years old. There's no way I can be a bodybuilder anymore. I've had too many operations, too many things wrong with me. Too many body parts ripped off and sewn back on. So uh, it was a situation. I just wanted to see, though, what my body would do response-wise if I gave it a plan. And so you, you sit down and you write a plan. And what I realized was, is that even when I was a competitive bodybuilder, my plan wasn't strong enough. I thought it was very strong. I lost lots of weight. I became ripped to shreds. I won many contests. But what I could see as an adult was if I would have had even a little bit better plan, I could have accomplished a lot more. I just didn't have a plan that had enough detail, enough granulization to be able to get me where I wanted to go, or I probably could have been competing at national levels like Mr. Universe or something like that. Uh, never got there, but I never had a good enough plan. So if you think about your plan and you're going, okay, I'm going to take a map and I'm going to go from Houston to Dallas, just because you have a plan doesn't mean the plan is the fastest, the easiest, and the most effective way to go, right? But you've got to have something to start with. You've got to start going a direction, and a plan is what gets you headed in that right direction. Now, when he talks about crystallization. He talks about organizing your plan and crystallizing your plan. There is an ongoing process with the plan. And that is, as you go along, you come across obstacles and then you have to readjust the plan. So if I get in my car and I go, okay, I'm going to go up 45 to Dallas, Texas. Um, Somewhere along the line, getting to 45, there might be closed roads. Now, the map's ineffective. I have to change the map. Sometimes I change it more effectively. Sometimes I change it less effectively. But the map has to change. It can't stay the same. It's not going to get you there. Sometimes you don't have to change your map. Sometimes your map is fine, but things pop up. For example, I might run into a train on a train track, and that might stop me 
Now, if I were to just quit and go back home because of the train, I would have been defeated. If I would have tried to get around the train, I would have found the train track goes miles in both directions. And I would have, you know, maybe been frustrated and not got across it. Sometimes you just have to wait things out in your plan, right? And so those kinds of things happen. Like you're on a strict diet and, you know, something comes up. You get sick, whatever it is. Uh, if something comes up, you might have to wait that something out and get on the other side of that something before you can keep going on your plan. So you have to have a plan. The plan is never going to be perfect, but you have to be on it and stick to it. Those things seem oxymoronically impossible to do, right? They seem like there's no way. If you're saying stick to your plan, well, you can't stick to your plan all the time, but you have to stick to a plan. It means that you better have one, and you better be following it, and then you better be prepared to deviate if necessary to get where you need to be, right? Now, also when you set up plans, it's important that you research that the plan makes sense. Uh, again, that's why it has to be a good plan. And so, I'm um, giving an example. I watched the thing. I bought a gun the other day that was very complicated, complex gun, I guess the way to say it. And uh, I watched a video by the top shooter in the country. And uh, I think the guy's name is Jerry Mikulik or something like that. But he's like the number one three gun competitor in the country. And he's been a gun expert for years on the internet. And he took this gun apart, but he took it apart in the most complex way I've ever seen in my life. And what was interesting was, is, I mean, he was taking parts apart, apart, apart. That just blew my mind. I'm going, I'm never going to get this thing apart and back together again. You know, those parts are just so complicated. They're so small and they're so hard to deal with. And they don't really show you. He didn't really show you exactly how you get them all right back together again. He was assuming because he was an expert that he was dealing with semi expert people and how to put these things together. Well, then I watched another one from a beginner. Eh, I'm not a beginner, but a guy that's, you know, wasn't the top-notch expert guy talking to top-notch experts, and he showed you the easy way to take the gun apart and break it down, clean it, and put it back together. So I decided that my plan, you know, there go my map, my plan, was to take it apart the easy way. And as I took it apart the easy way, I had no problem. The easy way is easy. (laughs) And I'm pulling it apart, and the pieces are coming off just fine. And I'm organizing them out on another table where I'm not cleaning so I don't get them out of order. I've got them right in the right order so they go back together right in the right position. you know. And I've got the picture of how it all goes back together. I'm not going to be defeated by this. In fact, to be honest with you, I took it about a quarter of a part and put it back together again. <laughs> Just say, I'm, I'm going to take that off, take these pieces off, and I'm going to put them right back on while I remember exactly where they came off of before I break it down infinitesimally small and don't remember how it all goes back together. So, lo and behold, I uh, got it apart, cleaned it, and uh, found that it was way more difficult to clean all these parts than I thought it was for most guns because it's just some really a lot of parts and, and difficult shapes and things to clean. But I got it cleaned. Uh, oh, and I'd also taken the gun and fired it a couple times and put it away and not cleaned it so that buildup was on there very hard. It was very difficult to get all the stuff off. And I worked and worked. I think it took me like an hour to clean this gun which is ridiculous. And so I got it clean, and I started putting it back together again. And uh, I'm sorry, but while I was cleaning it, I realized something. There was really no way to get it very, very clean without taking it and breaking it down into the infinitesimally small parts. Because the parts all put together, you couldn't clean them correctly. And the parts that the Jerry Mikulik, the expert guy, said that were the most important to get clean, you had to take apart to get them clean. So I went ahead and I took them apart. And I disassembled even further than I wanted to disassemble it. And I cleaned it and I got the parts clean. And then I go to put the stuff back together. And as I go to put the stuff back together, it was interesting because now... The map had taken me a different direction than I had planned to go. But because I was able to work through it 
and understand that I had gone this far on the map and then I went one block further and two blocks further and three blocks further, I could backstep myself through those one or two or three blocks that I hadn't intended to go. In other words, my brain had froze at the big map. But as I got to the railroad tracks, it didn't defeat me. We'll take a short break. Be back with the Del Wamsley Radio Show. Del Wamsley explains how he found that speck of light that got him into the lifestyle. I had a guy who used to come into the health club every day and work out for four hours a day, sit in the jacuzzi, swim, play racquetball, was happy, looked great, tan all the time. And one day I just asked him, what do you do for a living? And he said, Del, I own real estate. Well, do you own real estate? Register for our live online free workshop and find out how you can get all the things you want out of life with passive income. Register at lifestylesunlimitedworkshop.com. Brought to you by Lifestyles Unlimited. Welcome back. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Welcome back to Del Wamsley Radio Show. Today, we've been taking a deeper dive into Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And uh, on this segment, we're going to touch base on something called decision. And to decide is to cut off from all other options. Think about that. To decide is to cut off from all other options. Now, myself, I'm personally a vacillator. I'm a type B personality. If you gave me something to argue about, you could take either side of the argument. I could argue the other side. In fact, I probably would argue one side and then go, but wait, there's also this other point, right? This other side. Uh, That has been a hindrance to me my whole life. Some might say, well, that's good because you look at both sides at least and you, you know, you weigh things out and, you know, your, your wisdom to take a look at all the options and so forth. But at the same token, it's been a hazard to me because the ability to say it's done is something, it's a skill I had to learn. I had to learn a skill that said, I've decided. So let me give you some examples of stuff that I use it on. And, uh, it's, it's true about everything. When I decided to sell, uh, 11 apartment complexes and start buying class A's. That's that was quite a change in my portfolio. I've been in business for you know 30 years and say so, okay, I'm selling it. When I decided to sell all my single family houses and buy apartments, there was a decide. I cut off the concept of ever going back to single family. Uh, when I went to large apartment complexes, I cut off the concept of ever going back to small ones. When I cut off the concept of owning older properties and only owning Class A's, I've cut off the concept. I've said, no, I'm not going back there. Could I easily go back and buy Class C properties again? Of course I could. I don't want to. I'm done with that in my life. I have decided that's not where I want to be. And many times in life, you have to make those decisions. You have to cut off from. Getting married was a decision. I had to cut off the concept that I could date five women at the same time, and I could be free man to go do whatever I want, whenever I want. I had to decide that I wanted to be married. It was a decision. It cuts off any possibility of retreat. Uh, the Vikings, they always tell the story about the Vikings. They landed on the shores, and the guy that was in charge burnt all the ships by burning the ships he said look there's 10 to 1 out there against us our chance of survival are next to none but we have nowhere to go we either fight and win or we die he cut off all retreat he decided that they were going to win or be annihilated Um, on a more current basis something you can relate to is Back uh, when I got married, I had lost a lot of weight, and I had just come out of being sick. I had a colostomy sac. I had a intestinal removal, and had been in the hospital of the previous four months. I was in the hospital three of the previous four months, in and out, in and out. And so I was frail. I was weak. I could barely even hold myself up and stand up. And I decided that I, was, I don't want to be that way. So I started working out again. 
and trying to get back in shape. At the same token, I had gotten fat from not exercising for four months, and I felt like I needed to get into shape. Plus, I had a tuxedo I needed to fit into, so I started trying to lose weight. And I got my body weight down from about 220, 230, down to about 214. I fit in the tuxedo, and, you know, doesn't mean I was in great shape. Did hit the pool. Still didn't mean I was in great shape, but at least I got to where I could get married. I decided that's the way I was going to go. But as soon as I got out of the wedding, I said, you know what? I'm tired of being weak. I'm tired of my back hurting so bad I can't stand up straight. My feet and legs hurting so bad I can't walk. I've got to get back in shape. I've got to build some muscle tissue. And I had hurt my back right after, uh, right before we went to the expo. And I brought a physical therapist in and um, a doctor. And they showed me how to exercise my core. And so I started working out on my core. I decided I was going to fix my core muscles, and it hurt like a mother. And uh, I did, and I fixed them. And then I go, you know what, if I can do that, I can probably get the rest of my muscles working too. So I started lifting weights. And then my daughter started bodybuilding, a winning bodybuilding contest, and was getting ready to get her pro card. And I thought, you know, it would be nice if I had enough would be nice if I had a nice enough physique. I could stand next to my daughter and get a picture with her. You know, not that I was going to be a competitive bodybuilder, but I just wanted to look decent to stand next to her. I don't want to look like this slutherly low. And the, the reason I thought that was because I had t- taken a picture with her when I was sick as she'd won a bodybuilding concert. I looked terrible standing next to her. So I said, let's get a good daddy-daughter picture. So I started working out to get in shape for the daddy-daughter picture. And then all of a sudden it hit me. I started getting in shape. I started getting stronger and bigger and stronger and bigger and stronger. And I said, you know, I wonder, I wonder what I could do at 63. There's probably no way I could do anything at 63 years old. And so I trained and I put together a plan and I got with the people that were experts and they helped me with the plan. And all of a sudden I was 240, 245, 250, 255. And then all of a sudden COVID virus came. And my blood sugar was high. My body really couldn't handle 250. I was heavier than I'd ever been in my entire life. I was bigger and more muscular than I'd ever been. And I started thinking, hmm, this is not very healthy since they're saying people that have all these things wrong with them, like I had, uh, are the ones susceptible to COVID. So I said, I better lose some weight really quick. And I want you to understand this. Where I had made a decision I was going to go up to 255 or 260 and see what it felt like, I did it. And then I immediately made a different decision and said, you know what? Now I know what it feels like. I know what it looks like. And the look is not worth the feel. I'm going back down to a healthy body weight. And I said I was going to lose weight. And I told you on the radio when this occurred, I said, I'm going to go back down. I'm going to lose 15, 20 pounds. Well, I want you to understand that I made that decision when COVID started about two months ago or whatever it was, six, eight weeks ago. And I have since dropped from 255 pounds. I hit the scale the other day at 235 pounds. I lost 20 pounds in two months. And I'm still muscular and healthy. I just lost as much fat and unhealthy weight as I could. I decided I cut off all other thoughts. My friends, we're not talking about making a little bit more money here. We're talking about making decisions That will change the rest of your life. Not just the money, but the quality, as I like to call the lifestyle. Have a wonderful day. See you tomorrow. The information and opinions you hear on the Del Wamsley Radio Show are those of the host, Del Wamsley, his guests, and his callers, and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this station, its affiliates, its management, or advertisers. The Del Wamsley Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Del Wamsley Show constitutes an endorsement, recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.